Welcome to Life Bursts. I'm Matt. And I'm Sarah. Do you have a dishwasher or a washing machine in your home? Well, if you do and you've ever wondered where they came from and how they were invented, we're going to find out today. This is Life Burst. Great to have you joining us today. And uh, in the studio today, we have the privilege of learning a bit of history and hearing the story of Wendy. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you with us. Wendy, tell us, uh, where did life start out for you? Well, I grew up in Belair. My parents, well, my father was an engineer. And I had a younger sister, and oddly enough, we were all short. <laughs> I thought we were a normal family until after many years I realised that everybody was taller. But uh, when I grew up, I thought I was just a normal person. <laughs> okay. But there you go. Um, Dad, she's sitting on two pillows. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted, I was like, people are probably very confused right now because you're like the same height as us. <laughs> I'm on one pillow. I'm on two. <laughs> It's good. Look, great that you could all join. We didn't gave it. away our television secrets. <laughs> so, Wendy, uh, your story begins with your father's story. Yes. Uh, a big influence on you and where you went. Yes. Well, my father grew up in Clare. His father was the mayor of Clare. Okay. And then he was sent to Scotch College. And the thing he hated most was that he had to wear shoes. Because in Clare, all the boys used to run around without shoes. And he just found them so uncomfortable. So for the rest of his life, he wore shoes that were two sizes bigger than he really needed, so that they were roomy. And he wasn't a good student. He preferred to make things in the shed and mm -hmm. fix people's toys and fix people's aeroplanes and potter around making things. And he, Latin was a compulsory subject and he failed Latin, so he failed high school and they got him an apprenticeship. And then the Second World War broke out and he joined up and he was in the Air Force. Now, because he is short, when they uh, inspect people and decide what's a good career for them, he was good at maths and he was short and lightweight. And they decided he'd be a good, na a good uh, navigator. Okay. Okay. To get in aeroplanes. Ah. Yes. And so the pilots apparently chose their crew from the big mass of people that was available to him. Yeah. And he was chosen because he was small. Mm -hmm. So he became a navigator in a bomber and he um, got a distinguished flying cross, which apparently is very prestigious, mm -hmm. mainly due to the very high death rate. Uh, of yeah. the crews, that mm. if you managed to do a large number of sorties and survive, that, that was mm. quite a thing. And mm. he stayed in that uh, all through the war. And then at the end of the war, they used to take uh, politicians and dignitaries and officials out over the Europe to show them the devastation. And so they stopped all their security measures and their mm. procedures and on one of these he fell through the bomb doors that oh. hadn't been locked and he was hanging on mm. for quite some time <laughs> trying to shout to people to come and help him but nobody could hear him because it's a very noisy Noisy. environment yeah. uh, and eventually he was rescued and he said that all that time during the war he was scared that he was going to die and very frightened the only time he nearly died was after it was all over right <laughs> And he decided he wouldn't worry about anything for the rest of his life. Okay, fair. And <laughs> <laughs> yep, there's nothing, you know. I can, I understand that. <laughs> I never saw him shout or get angry. He was a very quiet, gentle person, and very studious. And he worked hard. Anyway, after he came back to Adelaide, um, the government had a system where if you had a technical job during the war. You could go to university even though you didn't necessarily have the right qualifications. Mm -hmm. So he did mechanical engineering. Mm. Also, another thing that happened at that time, um, in university, 
we see in movies, particularly American movies, about how they have all sorts of initiation ceremonies for students, some of which get a bit violent or a bit rude and quite unpleasant for them. Mm. And this was also in Adelaide University. Okay. But after the Second World War, when all of these soldiers came back who'd been taught hand-to-hand combat and how to kill people <laughs> and had actually put it into practice in many cases, yeah. when this group arrived at university as first-year students, there was no way that this culture of initiation could continue because mm. they wouldn't have it. Mm. Yeah, that's they just good. thought it was a load of ridiculousness. Mm. So it completely stopped. So Adelaide University hasn't had that culture since then. Okay. It's a very nice university to go to. Okay. So some positives come out of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gee. So um, when he was at uni, he was broke, of course, and he had a job. And one was driving taxis and another one was washing dishes at a hotel. And he decided that washing dishes is not a good thing. So he decided to invent something better. So he decided to invent a dishwasher. Mm. Okay. Something you could have in your house. There was at that time some industrial type dishwashers in Europe. Um, but that they were great big things and not something that you'd use at home. And he spent all of his spare money getting manufacturers to make the parts because the parts did not exist. Mm. Mm-hmm. Even dishwasher powder tablets did not exist. Mm. Nothing existed. Mm-hmm. So everything had to be manufactured. It's all very expensive getting somebody to make a one-off part. Mm. Mm. And also he had spent all his money on crockery and glassware from the op shops because in the early days of his invention, it was a dish destroyer. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Okay, trial and error. Yep. My mother was not much impressed with this <laughs> I bet. because he never had any money at all to mm. take her out to the movies or to dances because he spent it all on his dishwasher. So he spent so much time on it that he actually failed a couple of subjects in fourth year. And he had to repeat it. And they were this time they were married and they were really broke. In those days, after a woman got married, she wasn't allowed to work. Mm-hmm. So uh, she got some work with da- with Grandpa, who was an accountant, and she got work as a secretary because she could type. Mm-hmm. Um, and she had to support Dad at university. So he did eventually finish his degree and he got a job at Kelvinator's. Now, he patented his dishwasher Mm. and he tried to sell the patent to popes who were manufacturing at that time. Mm -hmm. And they helped him a little with his uh, project work as well when he was developing it. But they said it was not a working idea and it it wasn't going to work and nobody would buy it. Okay, famous last word. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So after three years after he was married and actually working, the patent fees were so expensive, they decided they just couldn't afford it. Mm. So they dropped the patent. Immediately, Pope started making dishwashers. Oh, okay. So in our family, the subject of dishwashers was never discussed. It was a we're not going to talk about it subject. Mm. And it wasn't for years when I was an older teenager that I discovered this story. Because we washed up by hand at home. Okay. My sister, mum said she had two dishwashers, myself and my sister. Yes. And we used mm-hmm. to sing while we washed up dishes and harmonise together. Mm-hmm. So it was rather fun, mm. singing dishwashing. Um, uh, until my sister got married and then I moved out of home, then she bought a dishwasher. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh no! Oh, oh. Okay, we're gonna leave it there, and we will be back straight after this of life bursts with Matt and Sarah. Welcome back to Life Bursts with Matt and Sarah. Today we're chatting with Wendy, and we're hearing about the invention of the dishwasher, mm. which is pretty awesome. You got to the part of the story where your sister brought a dishwasher because you weren't talking about dishwashers. 
up until this point. Yes. Because of what no, my happened. mum bought a dishwasher. Well, your okay. mum brought After a dishwasher. After my sister and I moved out of home. <laughs> oh, because you guys weren't there she anymore. She lost the dishwasher, yeah. What? yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when I got married and I we renovated our kitchen, I, of course, bought a dishwasher. And I discovered that you can't substitute dishwasher powder by using dishwashing detergent. <laughs> Yes. Don't do it. <laughs> we had a kitchen floor full of foam, mm. like in the movies. Yeah. And you can't get rid of them. They, you've got to f f get all this fluff yeah. out and then you just get more and more and more because you're still inside the dishwasher. It's a very time-consuming clean-up process. Better off to just take the dishes out and wash them by hand. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or, or go down the shop and buy some, the proper thing. <laughs> To put it there. Good, good tip. Yes. And um, these days we do own a dishwasher here. I use it to store my kitchen pans. Okay. Storage. <laughs> <laughs> Another cupboard. My husband likes to wash it by hand. Okay. Very good. Does he sing? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> now you're. Uh, we've been talking about your dad. So what's your what was what's your dad's name? Uh, John Bales. John Bales. Okay. And so your dad uh, not only uncredited invented the dishwasher. He also has some uh, history with washing machines too. Okay. Yeah. Tell us. Yes. Well, when he uh, graduated and went to Kelvinators, they were w working on washing machines. Now they had a washing machine you could buy at that time, which was an agitator. And then you have another device next to it where you take it out of the washing machine and put it through the wringer. Because this is oh, days before yes. drip dry and polyester and everything creased. And by the time you put it in a, through a wringer, it was just ruined, covered in creases. You hang it out on the line and then you have to iron it all. My auntie had a copper, which was a giant cauldron, and it, you put it over the top of a wood fire and mm. she had this huge stick which you stir it with, mm -hmm. and the clothesline was a long sort of thin rope thing on two big sticks. Mm -hmm. And if oh, you yeah. didn't handle it properly, it would fall over and yes. everything would go in the mud and you have to wash it all again. Yes, I know all about that. My grandmother used to have that <laughs> as well. Yes, if you didn't get it in the ground right at the right angle, just whoop. <laughs> yeah. So that's what people were dealing with at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, they were trying to invent a dish, a washing machine that would spin dry. Ooh. Ooh. And they had a prototype. Okay. And my mother got the prototype and she was instructed very carefully on how to use it. And my sister was in nappies at that time, which all had to be washed. There was yes. no cloth disposable yeah. nappies those days. They were cloth. And she decided to wash the nappies. And when she pulled them out, they were covered in dark brown stains <laughs> and she was so depressed at this because Pam needed clean nappies yeah. that she started crying and she couldn't deal with it with this experimental thing that just ruined all her nappies yes. <laughs> yeah and we didn't have a phone and she went to the neighbors who had a phone and rang up and said that the nappies are ruined and they didn't believe her and uh, she cried and a group of engineers, about 10 of them, all <laughs> drove over to our house <laughs> to inspect mum's washing. And firstly, they accused her of putting in dirty nappies. Right. Without yeah. cleaning them first. Okay. And uh, they were very accusational and, and she was crying. She was couldn't cope with it at all. Eventually they realised that the machine was leaking grease. Oh, okay. It was grease. <laughs> right. she, she still had a line full of ruined nappies yeah, that yeah, she yeah. couldn't use, but it wasn't her. No. It, no. it was the washing machine. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and wow. uh, when I was older, we had experimental white goods in our laundry. We had one washing machine that you just put the dirty washing in didn't have an engine mm -hmm. it was just a box and you could sit on it so when I needed a band-aid I was sat on there mm -hmm. and I, the first aid kit was nearby and that's the place to sit for band-aids and the other washing machine worked and we had experimental um, kerosene heater 
in the kitchen, which used to work okay sometimes, but every now and then it would explode and cover everything in the kitchen in black soot. <laughs> Why did you have an experimental heater? Well, they were trying to invent one yeah. for sale to the market, okay. but they, it didn't actually go into production because they couldn't get rid of this mystery occasional exploding problem. Yeah. And it makes yeah. people quite unhappy with things like that happening. <laughs> so why, why were you picked as the experiment? Well, Dad worked there. Yeah, well, yeah. This is the thing with the white goods companies because I ended up working for Electrolux mm -hmm. and they would give trial units to the families of the employees mm -hmm. working there. Okay, yeah. So you're just the guinea pigs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They could have picked anyone else, but your dad obviously put his hand up. To, yeah, well, you need to... someone who's not going to, who knows it's a trial unit and knows that things could go wrong. wrong. And then you need to be willing to report what happened. Yes. Um, but later on in dad's life, he joined the public buildings department and then he did a great deal of work on access for the disabled. And one of the things he was trying to do is to see what people in wheelchairs could cope with as far as slopes, going up and down slopes, what sort of slopes someone can push someone up and down, what height handrails they need, what diameter handrails, what radius of corners, what doorway sizes, what they need in a bathroom and a shower. Mm. And he wrote the code for access for the disabled. Okay. And later on, when we were in our other house, we had to put on extra toilet outside. And because we had to crash repairs, we had to put in a disabled access toilet mm. so that the public could use it if they needed to. Mm -hmm. And I had to follow this code to the letter, mm. sort of obligated. Dad was still alive at that time. We had these surely requirements for where the drain hole has to be. And why? And he said, because when you drop the soap, it will flow, it will move to where the drain hole is and it needs to be where you can reach it. Mm -hmm. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm just thinking about all those disabled access toilets right now. I'm yes. just thinking about those the showers, like literally what you're saying. Yes. They so I, I have a, on occasion gone on holiday while my back has been out. And I figure I might as well go on holiday because I could be at home with my back out or I could be on holiday with my back out. More fun to be on holiday. <laughs> Mighty inconvenience, but I've done it. And I have rated many of these places <laughs> when you go in there to, can I actually use the toilet? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Can I get to it? Yeah. Can I get to the sink to clean my teeth? No, I can't bend. Mm. <laughs> Quite. And, and you so, drop the soap just to see what would happen? Oh, God. <laughs> Some, sometimes these things are not well thought out when mm. you actually have to use them and you have serious problems. Yeah. Yes. Um, so your dad played a big part in, in, in raising the standards and yes. helping people. And he's, he spent a lot of time, he had models. For example, this little wheelchair here is a scale model and he had scale passages and corners and rooms and he would experiment with his model to see if people could actually get in and around with it. And also he went to visit all the homes and uh, residential care facilities and set up real ramps and make-believe rooms and asked people to negotiate it. So he did write the code, but what he told me was that it's virtually impossible to write something that suits everybody. Mm. Because mm. children can be in wheelchairs and their hand height is very low and their hands are very small. Six foot six men can be in wheelchairs and their hands are much bigger. Yeah. The places where they want to hold it, the strength of the, the rails needed to hold themselves up mm. is all different. He said it needs to be designed for the person who's using it. Mm. You can't have a global standard that suits everybody. And some people have a good right hand. Some people have a good left hand. Some people neither. And some people need to be assisted. And some people have to stand on this side or that side to assist. It's all very complicated. It really needs to be done 
for the person. Yes. Yeah, well, you can talk us through this little model that's on the table straight after this on Life First with Matt and Sarah. Welcome back to Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. And we're chatting to Wendy and uh, in Wendy's hands, uh, you're holding what looks to be a wheelchair. Uh, you were describing it earlier, something that was a bit of a prototype that your dad has, uh, has helped for those with disabilities. Yes, it's a scale model. Mm. It's for uh, working out um, on a scale room plan how you can get around corners in a wheelchair, what size doorways you need, uh, what position the hand basin should be in so you can actually reach the taps and uh, use the water. And we found this at Mum's house when we were going through her things, her things after she passed away. But uh, So what's it made of? Oh, it's, it's metal and rubber, real wheels, yeah. but all to scale. And it, it, here's, a, here's a hand. For, for with elbow for reaching. Yeah. Ah, okay. oh, there we go. He's pulled this together with whatever he could find and yes. uh, created. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now yeah. your dad was quite quite inventive then as a well, as an engineer. But, uh... I can't say I'm as inventive as my father. I always wanted to invent things, but <laughs> all the stuff I do is very minor. Because you've got another uh, another contraption here. Yep, pop that one down. Uh, Tell us what, what is this, this is a, a stick with a claw on the end. Not a cattle prod. Yeah, you could no. go to Cheapest Chips and buy something for picking up with. Yes. But Dad made this in the days where those things were not available. Yes, I've seen them with crocodiles on the end yes. now. So it's a claw that you... And he made this for yeah. Mum after she had a gallbladder bladder operation. This is days before keyhole surgery. Mm. And she couldn't bend and she couldn't get up off a chair and this is for uh, picking things up off the ground it was very very handy excellent yeah now your dad uh, for all that he you know he didn't get much credit for the washing machine but he was recognized for his contribution later on yes he got an order of australia we have a photo of that here we do yes my Good father morning. received an order of australia medal it's quite a privilege and honor to see your father receive something like that for the work yes. in the community how did you feel when your dad was oh i was very that? very pleased mm. yeah mum yeah. was very pleased too because he put a lot of effort into it and uh, he got some recognition for it and this was particularly for his work around the disability yes space? for access for the disabled yes yeah mm. fantastic mm. Oh, yeah, what it? year was that oh maybe 84 Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you have to dress up in your best? Frock? Oh, I didn't go. They went to Canberra. Oh, wow. Yes, okay. to meet the Governor General and get presented. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So your uh, your dad was obviously a big influence on you in lots yeah. of ways. Of course, all his friends were engineers as well. Right. Okay. And all they ever talked about was engineering, mm. much to my mother's annoyance. <laughs> and so I grew up amongst engineers. And when I went to high school and had to choose a career, I decided to be an engineer, uh, which was fine. Everybody said that's fine. But what they didn't say is, do you understand what it's going to be like to be the only woman? Mm. So I went to an all-girls school, I went to Warford, oh, okay. and I went to the orientation lecture and there were about, 200 engineering students there in the orientation lecture mm -hmm. and there were six women mm -hmm. and I was the only one in mechanical engineering mm -hmm. unbeknown to me I was the second woman to study it right. and the first one was 20 years before me wow so it was very unusual yeah and I felt like the odd one out right. Yeah, I was about to ask, how did you feel? How did you yeah, I, make friends? I wasn't an outgoing person. Mm -hmm. I was very quiet and shy. Mm -hmm. And I was in a class full of blokes and they decided that I should be this token woman. So whenever the, we had a guest who had to be welcomed or introduced, I had to do it. 
whenever there's anything special to do, I had to do it. And I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to be ignored at the back of the class. I didn't have that sort of personality. Mm. And there was no women's toilet in the mechanical engineering building. I had to go to civil engineering. They had one. How far was that? Oh, it was another building. Mm. Okay. And when we did uh, training in using machining, uh, like mm-hmm. lathes and, and cutters and other things, we went to the technical college mm-hmm. on Frome Road, I think it is in the city, uh, next to the teacher's college. In that building, there was no women's toilet, so you had to go down to the ground floor, out, walk around and go into the teacher's college mm. to use the ladies' loo. Mm. It was quite a trek. Yes. And yeah, it sounds like it. And I remember we did also welding course at the ENWS Waterworks Department where they trained their apprentices mm-hmm. and we had to start at, I think, 6.30. It was the middle of summer. We were doing welding. <laughs> and I had to wear overalls. And to get there, I had to catch a train from Belair and a bus out to somewhere where I had no idea where I was. So I had to leave home in the dark with a torch. And someone must have seen this torch walking along the road after a couple of days and reported it to the police. Mm -hmm. And the police came and stopped me. And there I am, this short girl wearing overalls and a torch. (laughs) Where am I going? I'm going to welding training Mm -hmm. at Ottawa or somewhere like that. (laughs) Yeah. What a different world. Yes. Did but you, I was a very good welder, actually. I was one of them. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> How did, as you were looking to uh, study this, uh, you know, in a very different world to today, mm. were you? Uh, did anyone try to, to, to deter you and say, look, yeah. you, you can't do this, you're a woman? No, nobody did that. Okay. Nobody at yeah. all. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I quit after second year. Okay or in second year, because I didn't want to do in, be an engineer. And then I got a job making, no, I went, I was an insurance clerk. That's ah. different. You've gone from being one of the best welders <laughs> and the only woman in the class to now doing that. Yes. and That's a job. And then I realised after I did that, if it takes you only two weeks to learn your job, and you're going to be doing the same thing for the next three years, that you get very boring. So every year we'd have an annual interview with the personnel officer and I would always burst into tears. Mm. I never remembered to take tissues and it was very embarrassing. (laughs) Eventually I promised I'll go back and finish my degree. Okay. Because I was bored. Yeah. And I went back to uni and I did second year. And third year, and fourth year, and halfway through fourth year, I quit again. Okay. Okay. I, I want to know about this husband that you keep talking about. <laughs> okay. Now, we, we have interviewed him before, so we have his side of the story. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what's your side of the story of how you met your now husband? Well, after I quit the second time, okay. I got a job making tailor-made sheepskin car seat covers. Okay, that sounds a little bit more unique than going in and doing <laughs> insurance. So, yeah. yeah. And I really enjoyed that, apart yeah. from the fact that I was a little bit allergic to the wool. Oh. Oh, yeah. But I enjoyed the work. Mm-hmm. It was very hands-on. Mm. And I used to be re- able to recognise any car from the inside, not from the outside. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. I could recognise a car by the shape of the headrest yeah. and where the seams were on the on the chairs. And the yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So what, what did you do? Just like look at the inside of the car and just be like, yep, whereas most people would look at Oh, I once went up to Queensland and got paid for a tour through the rainforest mm-hmm. and I got in the back seat of the car and said, oh, it's a Land Rover. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love this. Okay, well, we'll have a break and we'll come back straight after this with more Life Bus with Matt and Sarah chatting with Wendy. <laughs> Welcome back to Life Bus with Matt and Sarah. And today we are chatting with Wendy and I just asked her about meeting her husband, but I'm aware that there is a story in the lead up to this because we did hear Kay's version of the story Mm. uh, last season. So 
take us back. Okay, well, so I'm a happy little person making sheepskin car seat covers, and I was quite content and I was going to be single and have a low income for the rest of my life. And that didn't bother me. I okay. like saving money. I like buying very cheap things mm -hmm. and renovating them and I could get by. Mm. Um, then I developed an interest in nuclear physics. Mm. As one does. Yes. <laughs> so I... Just out of the blue? Yes. Randomly, like were you sleeping or something and you just woke up? You're no, like, I, I was sort of interested in it. Okay. And I got my old books from home and I was because I'd forgotten most of my maths so I got my old maths books and I was trying to work out what the formula was for the area or a circle by drawing it on the graph and counting all the squares to check was it pi r or pi r squared it's mm. pi r squared I know that I counted the squares okay I counted them all on the grid then and you forget all the formula. Then I worked out all these tricks for working out it might be this or might be that. Then work out, you do a little test with numbers you know the answers to and put them in your formula and you work out which is the right one. Oh, and because I'd forgotten most of it. Mm. And I was very, very interested in nuclear physics and subatomic atomic particles. Mm. And I read up on it a lot. And I used to get books from the library. And eventually I decided that the whole thing was impossible. Okay. God must exist. Okay. Oh, right. So this was like a soul-searching exhibition. <laughs> well, exhibition. It, it wasn't but... the intent. Ah, okay. But in, was... eventually I decided that the whole thing is just impossible because if I imagine myself going into the inside of a nucleus of an atom and I imagine myself to be an electron and way over there is a proton and how do I know there's a proton over there? I Can't don't talk to it. I don't know. Yeah. And I'm spinning around and spinning around. It can't see me. Doesn't know I'm there. I mean, there are subatomic forces, but why should there be subatomic forces? These are big questions. These are big, big questions. These are very big questions. Why is space <laughs> infinite? Mm. Why is time wow, okay. infinite? When you mm -hmm. meditate upon it, they are impossible. Mm -hmm. They can't, you can't do this without God. God okay. must exist. Now, I was a strong atheist. Right. My, okay. My father um, wanted to be a missionary when he was young. But during the Second World War, he used to study religious books to become a missionary. Um, but he was so horrified with the war, he didn't know why God didn't stop it. And eventually he decided that God did not exist and became a really strong atheist. Right. So we never discussed religion at home. However, my grandmother was a Baha'i. She met somebody on the balcony of the hotel in Clare. We don't know who it was. And she found out about the Baha'i faith and became a Baha'i. She was very, very keen Baha'i. She gave us all these books, which we put in a bookshelf and never touched in the bottom room. And she kind invited like us over to meetings at her house, which we never went to, <laughs> and avoided all of her Baha'i functions. Then my auntie became a Baha'i. Then grandma's sister became a Baha'i. But we never talked about it. So I, after deciding that God did exist, thought, oh, well, I'll ask Auntie Ruth for a book. And she turned up the next day. <laughs> Probably very excited. I she, oh, she was very excited. Um, we had become closer because her husband had passed away and she had season tickets to the Adelaide Festival Theatre uh, theatre productions. Okay. And so I was the only single person in the whole family I was the black sheep of the family. And she invited me along to go with her as the only single person. Mm -hmm. And so we used to chat together and I, she'd <laughs> ask me one day what I wanted to do with my life and what I thought was important. And she said, oh, you sound like a Baha'i. I said, oh, no, I've read about that. There's nothing in it. Oh, no, she said, because <laughs> I'd read a little booklet and I wasn't impressed years beforehand. 
Um, no, this time I rang her up and she came over with two very complex, heavy books. Mm. So I read the thin one first. <laughs> and that was about the most difficult book you could ever read. Then I got halfway through the second one and became a Baha'i. Okay. Which created quite a dilemma of how to tell my parents mm. since they were really mm. not into this. Mm. Um, nevertheless, I became a very happy, enthusiastic new Baha'i and we used to have uh, meetings at different people's houses. Now, I was not an entertainer. I never, ever had guests. Yeah, I got that vibe from when you were talking about being at university mm -hmm. and yes. the only female. Yes, I didn't have guests anything. and I didn't have a circle of friends. I was a bit of a loner. And I had my parents over twice a year, which means I washed up dishes twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> not in the dishwasher. Yeah. No, I used to pile them up around the kitchen. And when they got too many, I'd cover them with towels. <laughs> and then eventually I'd have to put a bucket in the kitchen because there was no space left. Yeah. And I washed them all up in a bucket and I had a very large crockery selection. So it took me quite a while to run out. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was I'm... feeling that too. <laughs> it would take you a really long time. This is from the, the woman whose father invented the dishwasher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just didn't wash dishes. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a large house or a no, I had rented or... them. One yeah. of those split houses. Oh, okay. So yeah. I had two bedrooms and a kitchen. It was large enough. So large enough to store all of your cutlery. Dirty crockery. And, crock <laughs> and I discovered stainless steel will rust. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Good to know. Okay. Especially if you leave it next to silverware or something like that. Wow. There's a metal interaction between the two different metals and it can make it rust if you leave it in water for long enough. So does that mean you... <laughs> Thanks for you experimenting yeah. on that behalf. I know. <laughs> I now know something for the rest of my life. And so do the people watching and listening. <laughs> so you Watch were... dishes, people. So I, I became a Baha'i yeah. and I was due to have one of these meetings at my house, mm. which is a big deal for me. Yeah. So I prepared all the teacups and... Did your washing. Did my washing. <laughs> teacups and sauces and uh, I'm going to digress. I met a lady... Recently, a friend of mine, she lives in Mount Gambier, and uh, she, she said to me, same thing. <laughs> she, she said, you taught me how to hide the dishes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she never knew. She said she came round to my place and the kitchen was a disaster and she sort of said something about it. And I said, no worries, I can fix that. And I got a towel and just covered it all. <laughs> I am going to say, I do remember back in the beginning of Life Burst and I came here one time and you said, yeah, you can just put your dirty dishes in the in the oven and hide it from your mother-in-law. There you go. Good tips. Because uh, we are in, this is this is your home, Wendy, where we're in the studio in your home, so. Uh, really happened, the domestic, people. The domesticity is not my thing. Beautifully neat. I'll go and check the oven afterwards. <laughs> I'm going now. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we were due to do this half an hour before the meeting. The same lady rang me up and said, oh, there's a wonderful guest speaker from overseas in town. We should go to that instead. And I said, but no, everybody's coming to our house. She said, don't worry, I'll ring them. I just did it. I just washed all my dishes. I cleaned the house. <laughs> I got the trays out, the teacups and the coffee and the biscuits and the cake, and she's cancelling it. Aww. So, much reluctantly, we had to go to this meeting. Now, I was at West Croydon and the meeting was at Norlunga. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got there, we were quite late. Not only that, Norlunga Centre is a big complex. Undoubtedly, by now, it's much, much, much bigger. But we had no idea where this meeting room was. We wandered around in the car park in the rain for one hour. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we found the venue, and we went in, and I must have been a bit bedraggled as well, and I sat down and everybody clapped. The whole thing was over. Oh. <laughs> and then oh. they invited everyone up for a cup of tea or coffee, and I thought, right, I am definitely in the mood for a coffee. <laughs> so I was, I was wet. It was summer, actually. Well, it must have been one of those summer wet days. Oh, yeah. It wasn't wet, cold. Yeah. Mm. But Right. I got in a queue for a cup of tea and coffee 
and I was introduced to the man two behind me, which is my husband. Okay. Oh, well, that's, a, that's a good spot. Good spot to pause. Well, hold that thought because, uh, yeah, there is more to the story to tell. We're chatting to Wendy. This is Life Burst with Matt and Sarah. This is Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. We're bringing you Wendy's story today. Wendy, we've just cut off at the moment you, you met your mm-hmm. now husband uh, across the room at, a, at an Olunga. Yes, in the queue for a cup of tea. Oh. So... I had actually seen him once before and he'd Ooh. seen me. Mm-hmm. I'd been in a meeting and I was wearing a secondhand velour pink tracksuit. <laughs> What's a velour? It's sort of like a velvet. Okay. And I was not this big, but I was not a slim person. And he had seen me at that meeting asking questions and he was fascinated. Fascinated by you. Yes, and he waited back apparently to speak to me afterwards, but I had volunteered to go and help clean out all the rooms at this camp and to check for belongings that had been left behind and things like that in all the rooms that people Mm -hmm. were in. So I was one of the last people to leave, so Mm. he didn't actually meet me. And a couple of months before... I had two Iranian ladies who were refugees, Baha'is, mm. living with me and they had wanted to go to a funeral and I told them I, I couldn't take them there, that I could pick them up and it was at, the meeting was at Pennington Hostel and I went there after work to pick them up and there was a room full of people and I asked who was it whose wife died? And they pointed to this very tall man diagonally across the the crowded room, Mm -hmm. tall, dark stranger across the crowded room. Mm. And I looked at him and I thought, oh, I wonder if he wants to get married. (laughs) (laughs) That was the first thought that entered my head. I thought, (laughs) Wendy, no, I'll eat something. (laughs) Don't go down that track. So I had met him. Mm. Across a crowded room. Mm. So we kicked off very swiftly and we got on really well. And I used to write letters to him, Mm. which he used to use dictionary and his son to help understand. And because his wife had died earlier Mm. and he had three kids, Mm -hmm. uh, I used to go over there after work to his house and I'd help the kids with their homework and read all the letters from school and tell him what all the bills were and the letters he got in the mail and cook dinner and sit with everyone while we watch TV. And then when everyone was asleep and the kids were put to bed, I'd go home. Mm. And I was falling asleep in the car regularly. It was dangerous. Mm. And we had sort of decided that we would get married, but I didn't want to wait too long because... I'll have an accident. Mm, yeah. And so I told my mother um, that we came home and said we're engaged and we want to get married. And she said, well, you have to wait because we're going overseas in two months. <laughs> and it takes a long time to organise a wedding. Of course, you need at least a month anyway for notification. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, oh, no, organising a wedding is really easy. I can do it in a day. <laughs> you can. Right. Yeah, I made a few phone calls. I found a place that had a vacancy on the date we wanted and we went over the, the next day, all of us, my husband and I and, and my parents, and it was at McLaren Vale. It was a restaurant. Mm-hmm. And they had some menus and we chose a menu. They had colours that they have all the serviettes and everything for that yeah. they can decorate the room, the choice of four. I chose a colour. Don't remember what it was. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter. <laughs> At the time, it mattered a lot, but no, no, no it didn't matter to me. I oh, didn't okay, care. It didn't matter. I just wanted to get married. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't into ceremonies. Yeah. And besides, his wife had just recently passed away. She had cancer, mm. and he couldn't do a big celebration. It wouldn't be appropriate. Mm. So we had a small wedding. Mm. I think about thirty-five people. And you can organise it in a day. Right. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> and the day, two days before 
I didn't know it. It's a Persian tradition that the groom buys the dress. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. How did so that we go? went into town and we bought a dress for me and some shoes and I didn't realise it, but my husband gets very stressed when he goes shopping. If he has to stand still for more than a minute, his back aches. Mm, I can't so, relate to that at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> I chose the cho shoes for my wedding in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I had to be quick. Wow, yes. <laughs> no debatey things and go around the shops and trying this on and that on and that on. Yeah. No, 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 no. Choose it and be done with it. And uh, it was a, a relatively simple wedding and I was quite happy. Great. Because I was madly in love with him. Mm. But the day before we got married. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said to me that he wouldn't marry me. <gasps> Unless I promised to go back to uni and finish my degree. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, good bargaining. So he had two master's degrees. Mm -hmm. One that he never discusses, which is in zoology. Didn't discover that for several years, but apparently he hated it. Okay. Didn't like dissecting animals. You know, while we're recording this, he's like out in the producer room just like listening to you right now. <laughs> Secrets out. And his other degree was in biology. Could you just turn out your And he was a on teacher. <laughs> and in his later years, he used to teach at the teacher training school as well and at high schools. And it's very much into education. Mm -hmm. And he thought that I should finish my degree. And I didn't want to finish my degree, but I was madly in love. So I said, yes. Mm. <laughs> So, and you have to understand what sort of person I was when he met me. I was a very strange person at that time. About six months beforehand, I'd, or maybe a year beforehand, I'd gone through a phase where I was meditating about life and I realised that all of my attitudes and my standards were based on advertising and media and okay. magazines. Mm. Okay. They weren't my attitudes. They were the attitudes of what people wanted me to think. Mm. And I got really, really angry. And I went into my bedroom and I destroyed every pair of my shoes. I destroyed all of my jewellery and I ripped up all of my clothes in this intense two-hour period of anger. Right, this crisis. Towards the world. So yeah. by the time I had finished, I realised I had nothing to wear mm. to go, even to go out in the garden, because I've always liked gardening, except I had missed the washing hamper. Oh, OK. <laughs> In the washing hamper was a pair of bathers. Right. <laughs> Later that day, the neighbours saw me <laughs> gardening wearing bathers. He thought it was an odd sight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> we are only up to when you're in your 30s, so yes. we are going to have to have you back to continue to share more of your life stories. Okay. But I am aware that you do have a piece of advice to share about meeting a husband. So we have one minute. One, one minute. minute. One well, minute. you always imagine you're going to be in your best clothes with your makeup on and your hair done perfectly and a beautiful dress. So I was wearing a second-hand dress after being out in the rain for an hour. Yeah. Um, in a queue for a cup of tea, and that's where I met my husband. So all those years and years earlier, I spent all this time making myself look gorgeous. And I was a hot chick once. <laughs> uh, well, it's a waste of time. <laughs> oh, well, there, there you go. What a great way to leave on, on that note. But, uh, Wendy, I love your stories and there's lots more to share. So we look forward to bringing you back uh, next week as uh, you continue your story, hear more from you. 
Yes, this has been Life Burst with Matt and Sarah. You can catch up with us wherever wherever you get your podcasts from, uh, on social media, television, and community radio. This has been Life Burst. I am Sarah. I'm Matt. Have a great week. Life Bursts is hosted by Matthew Karat and Sarah Freeman, with production by Reese Jarrett and Kay Hoshra Ozadigan. For more episodes of Life Bursts, go to rawcut.com.au. This is a raw cut production.